Welcome back. At this time, I'm now gonna introduce Steve Frang, who is a wonderful ADAPT Advisory Council member. He is also the Prevention and Treatment Manager for the Northwest Haida, and he's gonna be introducing our wonderful panelists today from the Centers for Disease Control. Steve? Welcome back. My name is Steve Frang, and I manage the Treatment and Prevention Initiatives for the Northwest High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area, or Northwest Haida, and also serve on the Advisory Council for ADAPT. So we've had an opportunity to hear insights from the Office of National Drug Control Policy, the Surgeon General's Office, and the National Institute on Drug Abuse regarding their approaches to substance use prevention and how their agencies are moving forward to address current and future challenges. I now have the privilege of introducing the panel from the Centers for Disease Control. Dr. Rita Noonan is a sociologist and branch chief in the CDC's Division of Overdose Prevention. Dr. Noonan and her staff oversee prevention and evaluation strategies that support the CDC's $300 million program, Overdose Data to Action, or OD2A. OD2A is designed to reduce drug overdose deaths and related harms in the United States by providing funding to 47 states and 16 large city-county health departments to improve health, public health surveillance, implement evidence-based prevention strategies, and shed light on emerging innovations in the field. Dr. Noonan also works closely with several HIDAs, managing the public health component of ONDCP's overdose response strategy that links public health and public safety across 30 states. She's been the recipient of several prestigious awards, including a Fulbright Scholarship and a MacArthur Fellowship. She received her PhD from Indiana University. Grant Baldwin is the director of the newly created Division of Overdose Prevention at the CDC National Center for Inju Injury Prevention and Control. In this role, he's responsible for monitoring trends in the opioid epidemic and other emerging drug threats, as well as identifying and scaling up prevention activities to address the evolving drug crisis. This includes supporting local drug-free community coalitions. Prior to this appointment, Dr. Baldwin served as the director of the Division of Unintentional Injury Prevention for 11 years, where he helped raise the profile of motor vehicle injury prevention, advanced work in older adult fall prevention and traumatic brain injury prevention, and established the initial CDC response to the prescription opioid overdose epidemic. He received his PhD in health behavior and health education at the University of Michigan. He received an MPH in behavioral sciences and health education from Emory University, where he is currently an affiliated professor. Karen Boach came to the CDC in 2003 as a Presidential Management Fellow after receiving her MPH in Health Behavior and Health Education from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In her 17 years at CDC, she has led a number of efforts in communication, strategic planning, budgeting, and partnership development for the Prevention Research Centers, the Alcohol Team, the Division for Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention, and the Healthy Schools Program. She has also helped to create new programmatic initiatives for several community-based programs, such as the STEPS program, Communities Putting Prevention to Work, and the Racial and Ethnic Approaches to Community Health program. Karen also has an international health background, having served in the Peace Corps in West Africa and as a CDC assignee on non-communicable diseases and road safety issues in Botswana. Currently, she's the branch chief for the Drug-Free Communities Program within the Division of Overdose Prevention and National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. She lives in Decatur, Georgia with her husband and two children. And now, our CDC panel. Well, good morning. Thanks so much. It's certainly an honor and privilege for us to be with you. The three of us have a number of goals for this session. I'll be giving you an overview of the public health approach to drug overdose prevention and showcase really at a macro level, some of our signature investments and treasured programs. And then Rita and Karen will drill more deeply into our ongoing work between public health and public safety and talk at some length about uh, the drug-free communities program. There should be ample time for questions at the end, so please type them into the managed Q&A or be ready to share them when we get there. Next slide. So you know the numbers well, but every time I hear them, they serve as a clarion call. We have lost over 840,000 of our fellow Americans since 1999. This includes almost 72,000 in 2019 alone, 
or about 197 per day, and that number has never been higher. The decline between 2017 and 2018 was likely caused by a temporary decrease in deaths from car fentanyl in states like Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida, Kentucky, and Michigan. And while prescription and heroin involved opioid deaths are declining, deaths involving fentanyl and fentanyl analogs continue to skyrocket. And opioids are now nested in a broadening polydrug crisis driven by psychostimulants like cocaine and methamphetamines. To summarize, geographically in recent years, we're seeing a westward expansion of fentanyl and an eastward expansion of meth, and this is all pre-pandemic. Next slide. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, it looks like, unfortunately, 2020 will be even worse. Staff from the New York Times queried state and local health departments, as well as medical examiners and coroners in the 14 states listed on the bar chart on the slide for the first portion of 2020. They found an average of a 13% increase in deaths, with deaths in some areas like Delaware, Washington, Wisconsin, Colorado, and Rhode Island being substantially higher. And data from ODMAP, a smartphone-enabled real-time monitoring tool launched by the Washington and Baltimore high-intensity drug trafficking area in 2017 and now being used widely, as you know, supports this conclusion as well. ODMAP generated spike alerts have increased 191% between January and April of 2020 compared to the same period in 2019. And after March 19th of this year, when state mandated stay at home orders started to go into effect, 62% of participating counties experienced an increase in overdose submissions. And overall, there was an 18% increase in suspected overdose submissions when, cam when comparing to the weeks prior to and following the comm commencement of the stay at home orders. Next slide. So CDC's work in this area sits within the Injury Center, within a division that I lead that was actually just formally stood up about a year ago, although formal funding for CDC began about five years ago and we've been working in the area for about 15 years. So we have three overarching goals to help reduce opioid overdose deaths right now. There's an urgency of the now to address emerging drug trends like cocaine, methamphetamines, and even marijuana and to prevent youth initiation and use. And within the division, we have six key strategies that address these uh, overarching goals. And they are within research to, con to conduct applied research to answer really very specific questions and solve practical problems that um, demand attention now. In terms of data, we're interested in um, tracking trends and using data to drive action with populations and in communities most affected to strengthen state, local, territorial, and tribal capacity to scale up evidence-based programs and of, and among healthcare providers to improve patient safety while giving clinicians the data, tools, and resources they need uh, uh, as they practice. And the final two are within the space of uh, public health and public safety to build or strengthen partnerships between public health and public safety and other community-based organizations to identify threats and to help link people to treatment and recovery services. And finally, to empower the public to make safe choices by creating campaigns that address use, misuse, abuse, and as well as messages that attend to stigma. Next slide. So now more than ever, the seamless integration of data informing action is essential because of the potency and rapidly shifting illicit marketplace, as well as the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a map of the 66 funded jurisdictions who are part of overdose data to action. 47 states and 16 big cities or counties are funded. This is $300 million per year for three years. And this integrates all of CDC's state-based funding into one announcement. It's about using more timely, comprehensive, localized, integrated, and actionable data to catalyze prevention and response activities. And OD2A encompasses a breadth and depth of prevention strategies that you see listed on the slide, including prescription drug monitoring programs, state and local integration of activities, linkage to care, provider, as well as health system supports, and of course, those public safety partnerships, among others. 
Overall, states receive anywhere from 2.3 to $7.5 million in funds, of course, with a tremendous amount of flexibility in how they use those resources to tailor what they do and to test out new evidence-informed prevention strategies. We just entered year two of the program, and OD2A will run through August of 2022. This is the first time CDC funding is going directly to the hardest hit counties, cities, and communities. So in addition to those 16 local jurisdictions I mentioned earlier, the New Yorks, Baltimores, Chicago, Houstons, et cetera, a minimum of, uh, a minimum of 20% of state-based prevention funds will be used in targeted mini grants or sub awards to counties and cities hardest hit. And that's of course just a floor. States can distribute more funds to counties and cities as well. Um, and we recognized at the time that we needed to make a, uh, an even bigger and more tangible difference uh, that we could do that if we augmented our state funding with funding directly to those communities. Next slide. So I suspect all of you are familiar with the March 2016 CDC opioid prescribing guideline for chronic pain for primary care providers. The, for us, the success of the guideline really hinged in part on our effective dissemination of it. So for example, we developed uh, communication and translation materials to make the guideline more accessible. So for example, a checklist and a mobile app that's actually been downloaded over 120,000 times. We are now better educating providers both when they are first trained um, and through ongoing continuing medical education. We created 12 interactive trainings um, that have been taken actually almost 50,000 times on topics like communicating with patients, dosing and titration, and assessing and addressing substance use disorder. We also developed 16 quality improvement or QI measures that aligned with the 12 specific guideline recommendations. And as a companion, we also created an implementation package for healthcare systems and, and are now in the process of supporting 11 systems direct or directly to rigorously test and evaluate it. The guideline authors also published a commentary in the New England Journal of Medicine last year to address the misapplication of the guideline, specifically some policies and uh, practices that were purported, purportedly derived from the guideline have in fact gone, have, have been inconsistent with and often gone beyond it, like pursuing aggressive tapering protocols that, were, that weren't warranted and frankly that could lead to poor health outcomes. And finally, when the guideline was first re released, we realized and said that we would revisit this guideline as new evidence becomes available to determine when evidence gaps have sufficiently closed um, to warrant an update to it. And that's actually what we're exploring right now. We're funding AHRQ to update or conduct a total of five systematic reviews um, and areas that we're uh, potentially going to update the guideline on, including uh, providing additional detail on non-pharmacologic and non-opioid pharmacologic therapies for chronic pain, updating information on the benefits and risks of non-pharmacologic, non-opioid pharmacologic and opioid therapies for chronic pain, expanding guidance to include uh, acute pain, and expanding what we say about opioid tapering. We've established and requested input from an ex expert work, work group that's part of the Injury Center's Board of Scientific Counselors. And we stood that up in December of last year. We're also seeking input from patients, providers, and the general public through a, a wide variety of means, including um, several av avenues that will be offered with direct public comment. So more on that um, shortly. Next slide. So as I mentioned, you'll hear a lot more of this from Rita. One of the ways CDC is broadening our work is by strengthening the partnership between public health and public safety further. And one signature program involves a collaboration between CDC and the high intensity drug trafficking areas or HIDAs in 30 states around what we're calling, and you're probably familiar with this, the overdose response strategy. We have three goals for ORS and they are to coordinate data sharing uh, between public health and law enforcement, to develop and support the implementation of evidence-based programs, and to strengthen engagement of local communities and promote the inclusion of those most impacted by the crisis when designing, planning, and implementing ORS activities. 
We're supporting a public health analyst and a drug intelligence officer in each of the HIDAs that are supported. And you see the map uh, that reflects our current footprint. We hope to expand that program. And I'm sure Rita will talk uh, more about ORS and her remarks. Next slide. So in 2017, we launched the RX Awareness Campaign. This was really the first uh, ever federal um, effort to raise awareness about the dangers of prescription opioids. The campaign tells the uh, real stories of real people whose lives have been impacted by prescription opioids. The goals of the campaign are fourfold. First, to increase awareness that prescription opioids can be addictive and dangerous. Second, to lower prescription opioid misuse. Third, to increase the number of patients seeking non-opioid pain management options. And finally, to increase awareness about recovery and frankly, to reduce stigma. In July of this year, we launched a new phase of a number of new stories as part of the um, ever evolving RX awareness campaign featuring audience, audiences that are heavily impacted that have not been historically showcased including pregnant women, veterans, younger adults, older adults, and American Indians and Alaska Natives. And you see some of the pictures of the individuals featured. Based on the lessons that we learned from our initial release, the new campaign messages evolved to be more positive, more empowering, and frankly, more hopeful. We now fe feature people in recovery, emphasizing the message that there is hope and that recovery is possible. These new stories are running right now in advertisements in select states across the country. So we're currently supporting work in West Virginia, Utah, New Mexico, and Alaska. I encourage you, please, to check it out. And let me close by saying a few words, and again, Karen's going to drill in uh, much further on this, about the Drug-Free Communities Program, or DFC. With just a modest investment of $125,000, the central aim of the DSC program is to utilize community-based coalitions across the 12 sectors that you see listed on the slide to organize to prevent youth substance use. And the DSC program includes a community match requirement to further entrench uh, both commitment and, and buy-in. And a community can be funded for up to 10 years. The program itself was actually launched in 1998 and has grown substantially since then. Uh, in fact, it's impacted over 2,000 um, communities over the life of the program. There, are, there were over 700 coalitions last fiscal year. And something that's very um, touching to me that is to know that one in five Americans now live in a DFC community. And beginning this fiscal year, CDC is now collaborating with ONDCP to administer the program, working closely with our uh, colleagues and friends at CADCA as well. I will say that a national evaluation showed that past 30-day prevalence of alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, and prescription drug misuse declined significantly among middle and high school-aged uh, youth in the DFC-funded communities. As a specific example, prescription drug misuse was down almost 25% uh, in those communities. Next slide. So thanks so much. I've tried to really set up today's conversation and outline what for you what CDC uh, is doing as the nation's public health agency in doing our part uh, from preventing people from developing a substance use disorder in the first place and ensuring uh, that people that have problematic substance use are linked to harm reduction, treatment, and recovery services. I, I know that what we are aiming to do is very, very ambitious. I want to end with a quote. I have a nine-year-old son. His name is Aaron. He loves baseball. And it just so happens that in his room, uh, he has a Babe Ruth quote on his wall. And I think it applies to us as well. And that's why I'm sharing it. Ruth once said that it's hard to beat a person that never gives up. That's you. That is me. And in my mind, that is the work um, and the commitment that we need to have uh, together to make a dent. With that, thank you for the time. And I will turn it over to Dr. Noonan. Thank you, Grant, and thank you, everybody, for making this uh, opportunity possible. I want to thank all of our wonderful colleagues at ONDCP for this opportunity. Director Carol, Chantel, National Haida Director, a very close collaborator, Jamie Delano, and of course, Amber, for setting everything up. It's um, it's really a delight. So thank you for us to be here. Um, so as, as uh, Grant had indicated, I'm going to 
to address some of what you saw as the uh, CDC agency-wide approach to addressing the drug overdose problem. And I'm going to highlight how we're working with public safety. And we are intentional about talking about public safety as partners rather than law enforcement because our partners include all kinds of folks, first responders, and the law enforcement personnel also like to be um, understood and seen as part of community solutions, and they do so much more than enforce laws. So we're very intentional about the public safety uh, label for this kind of work. Um, so as you can see, the slide shows the overdose response strategy. Grant already gave a little primer on this, and um, I'll dig in a little bit deeper, but I just wanna say that this is incredibly novel. This was an approach that was funded first by ONDCP, and I think it was courageous and very insightful to try something new. This is a novel approach where we bridge public health and public safety. It started in 15 states with five HIDAs, and you can see now that um, we have public health analysts in 30 states and drug intelligence officers in many more states. So it's really growing and turning into a national enterprise. Next slide, please. So you can see we have, um, as Grant indicated, a very intentional collaboration. And the collaboration, Grant mentioned the goals, but the collaboration is intended to share data, to share strategies, with the intent that we can bring this kind of knowledge and support into communities so communities can address their own problems and devise their own solutions. So it's very, um, it's really meant to be collaborative at our kind of national level, state level, and down into the community level. So you can see that this slide indicates different ways that we are investing uh, and supporting at various levels. You can see the, um, Cornerstone projects, I will mention momentarily. That's a sort of the level of the entire initiative. We also have state teams, and I will mention what they're doing very briefly. And then we also have local innovation. So I'll highlight those very um, sort of top level view and then happy to answer questions at the end. Uh, next slide, please. The next slide, you can see what people have asked us. Well, it's a really good idea to have public health analysts and drug intelligence officers working together but what do they actually do? And I think that's a good question. And we're trying to be very concrete about the value that they can bring again to states and localities and to regions. And then when we bubble all of that up to a national level, how do we, um, how, how can we be of, of most help? So some of the things that they do, you can see are linkages to care. They have shared projects in that arena. We had one report that highlighted linkages to care and those efforts that some might call a warm handoff or um, you know, taking a page out of the HIV playbook, linking people in care and trying to retain them in care to solve uh, a disease problem. So we took a lot of strategies from HIV and we have folks working together to uh, link people who need treatment and, and care um, through public safety venues in many cases. We have data analysis, that's the second pillar you see there. We have different kinds of reports that we can use and share information together, again, to solve problems as locally as possible. You can see naloxone is one of our pillars. There are some efforts to, for example, provide prisons and jails with naloxone when folks are being released. It's a very, um, it's a, a, a time of high vulnerability for people leaving settings of incarceration. So there've been those kinds of efforts. And then certainly the, the fourth pillar, the spike responses, we've had just a, a wonderful collaboration with the Washington Baltimore Haida. Tom Carr, Jeff Beeson, our just incredibly innovative colleagues have uh, devised what you all probably have heard of as OD map. And I'll mention that a little bit later, but the information that we get has to do more than just uh, be an interesting data sharing arrangement or fast information. Data has to be used for some purpose. So we've been working very hard at trying to understand what do we do now? What should those responses be to a spike, for example? So we have our PHAs and DIOs working on those kinds of things as well. Next slide, please. So I mentioned one of the, um, one of the, sort of the most national level at the level of the entire initiative of the ORS, we engage in what we call cornerstone reports and, and this is our way to answer a question that affects all of us. We might have a question about something very emergent. And this is how the whole thing started. We should drug on the streets. And the drug intelligence officer, we didn't understand very well. And so we engaged them and very quickly pulled together information across all the states. 
having done that, we said, you know, this is really, this is a great way for us to quickly build information together. So you can see fentanyl report, we've looked at things that we all care about, Good Samaritan laws. What is knowledge, understanding, and attitudes about that on the front lines with um, law enforcement officers, patrol officers. After that, we did a linkage to care report. And then the one that we're, we're working on and finalizing right now, I think is really, really, um, again, it's, it's innovative, it's new information that is helping us drill down into jails, which is a setting that was a little bit neglected, at least in our world. We had been thinking about prisons a lot. Um, and then we realized from public safety partners that there's so much more traffic and, and people circulating in and out of jails. We really needed to understand more how jails can be part of um, protecting people and, and helping them get to care. So you can see that is our most recent one. It will be available shortly. And all of these, um, the other three, Fentanyl, Good Sam, and Linkage to Care are all available. I'm happy to make those available to you. And Jessica Wolf, I think, is going to share those in her presentation. So let's click to the next slide. Um, this is another one of the areas that I highlighted as um, where we put our little stake in the ground and how we can how we can better understand what's going on and serve communities. We have pilot sites which don't occur in every single Haida um, or every single state, but we pick a few of them every year and we support them so we can grow evidence and really try to nurture and support things that look very promising. Again, these are locally derived, locally supported, and we're really trying to empower the folks who are there on the front lines. So we have a, a number of different things we've looked at. Um, one, the, the bottom one is an example of an EMS post-overdose outreach program. And this is right here in Atlanta in Grady Hospital. And we're linking people to care and using a model that was used for psychiatric events where team would go out and link folks to care. So um, we're trying to be as innovative as possible. So these are just some examples. Next slide, please. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't highlight some of the other really important partnerships. Um, again, I could be here all day telling you about them, but I want to just highlight a couple of things and then just point you in the direction for resources. And um, Jessica Wolf can also provide some of those links in her presentation. So I mentioned ONDCP really was our big partner right out of the gates, uh, really meaningful work with ORS. And then we said, you know, there's probably a few more things we can do together. And I think we've had um, a lot of really good traction with what we're calling the Kukli program. And these are uh, little grants that go to communities. It's called Combating Opioid Overdose Through Community Level Intervention, or Kukli. And Kukli is, again, a shared enterprise with two federal partners, but again, trying to in the um, down to communities and, and learning from communities what we should be doing more of. So these really are little, um, like little seedlings and we're trying to water them and see which one should grow up into um, you know, big, big, sturdy oaks. So I think that's been we're going to take some of those samples and bubble them up again and share them nationally. Uh, so thank you, Oni, for working with us on that. We also have a collaboration with Bloomberg Philanthropies. Yes, about this. We have a toolkit that we're providing for communities that want to work with public health and public safety to use local data, to drive decision-making. And there's a model for that that we have been borrowing heavily from that was used in New York City, but it really is evolving and growing and it's tailored for every community differently. So we'll, you'll hear more about that later, but that's called the FAST Toolkit. Um, the third one there is the National Governors Association, and they've just been a wonderful partner for understanding policy level um, practices um, strategies, the kinds of things where you would want the governor's office and people at that level to come together and really think about what can we do better. Um, and we have um, a roadmap that we're de that we're developing with them. We've developed others in the past, and they're just a great organization for um, gathering people together. So that particular effort is trying to reduce risk among justice involved populations. Stay tuned. We don't have that one fully developed yet, but we've made a lot of headway. The fourth one is the National Council for Behavioral Health. We have continuing work with them. And this particular thing I want to highlight is a toolkit for MAT or medication assisted treatment in criminal justice settings. You can see we've been trying to put a lot of effort on very disproportionately affected populations, vulnerable populations. And I think that some of these tools are meant to be shared widely. So you'll be hearing more about these. Um, and finally, the Bureau of Justice Assistance we have a good federal partnership with them and lots of little, again, 
seed projects, summer in rural communities, we have statewide in some cases. So we can learn about how that tool for faster data and identification can be used and how it can really drive action. Um, and a number of other things we're doing. So I don't want to belabor that too much. Next slide, please. I want to make sure Karen has her time. Um, so just an example of one of the Cookleys. And as I mentioned, these Cookleys are meant to um, really understand local innovation. They're relatively small investments on the part of ONDCP and CDC. And we are looking across all kinds of strategies. You can see some of them here. It could be warm handoffs, post overdose outreach, um, trying to better understand, can we use AmeriCorps? Can we use volunteer groups like that to connect people to treatment and recovery, for example? Um, what can we do to serve the Latinx community better, for example? I really appreciate that Grant Baldwin talked about the RX um, campaign and how we're, we're trying to reach more audiences and more diverse audiences um, so that we can be of you know, better national support to everybody. So the Kuklis are uh, really lots of little interesting things and you'll hear more about those. Um, next slide, please. I wanted to just tell you about one of them in particular though, because it was driven by a local police chief in Martinsburg, West Virginia. And he was very interested in doing, doing the kind of work that we would call upstream or early prevention in public health. Our public safety friends are on the front lines often delivering news getting involved when a ship has sailed and people are in trouble, communities are in trouble. And this police chief earlier in prevention and helping people, children who've already been exposed to some risk and helping families recover and get the care they need and to break some of these cycles um, where children are exposed to what we call adverse childhood experiences. So this I think is a really wonderful novel uh, approach driven directly from um, our public safety partners. And we've been investing in this through Kukli and other venues to better understand how can we replicate this model? What, what, what can we do to support this so these kinds of um, activities can flourish and we can understand what they're doing or not doing? So next slide, please. I mentioned OD Map, and OD Map, you're probably very familiar with it, developed from the Washington Baltimore Haida. Um, and this is an app that's on a phone, an Android or um, Apple format. And at the site of a suspected overdose, first responders can simply click and say, this was a suspected overdose, whether or not they uh, administered naloxone. And it gives you very real time data in the areas where ODMAP is being used. So we have doubled down on this. We think it's, it's an amazing tool for communities, um, very innovative, um, kudos to our partners who came up with such a fast way of understanding what's going on. And I think importantly, what do we do now that we have faster information? How do we start learning and doing? Partners, um, tools you can use, Jessica Wolf Thunder. There's a session later this afternoon and I wanted to put a little teaser out there for you. We have um, some toolkits and things that are ready to be used that are to treatment for opioid use disorder in jail prisons. This was a collaboration across local partners. Shout out, it is online. And the second one, just wanted to put a teaser out for the FAST toolkit. And again, this is meant to help communities come together and figure out how, how could you do, for example, um, an assessment of your community. What kind of goals would you share? What kind of data would you bring to the table? Who needs to be there? How do we share information and take action? Um, New York City has a model for doing this, but lots of other communities are, are doing the same kind of work. So we're trying to help everybody understand how, how they can do this if, if they so choose. So I'm gonna stop there and just again, thank you so much. This has really been um, a labor of love. And when I say that, it's a little tongue in cheek. I actually, just got engaged to somebody that I met through doing this work. Um, and he's the Heidi director in Ohio. So to say it's a labor of love, it has a whole new meaning for me now, as does public health and public safety collaboration. So um, anyway, I just want to thank you all so much. And it was a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Rita. Uh, my name is Karen Vetch, and I am the branch chief for the Drug Free Communities Program um, at CDC. Uh, as of October 1, we are the day-to-day uh, -day managers of the, um, of the Drug Free Communities Program, and we're thrilled to be 
to have this program as part of our prevention portfolio um, in close collaboration with ONDCP, in particular Helen Hernandez and Victoria Kaminsky. Um, and we've learned a great deal already about the program and are looking forward to um, our continued partnership and support of DFC coalitions across the country. Uh, next slide. I wanted to start a little bit about uh, the uh, youth substance use in the United States. And this was a recent study that was released by CDC. And though we do see patterns declining, substance use among high school students does remain common. Approximately one in three students reporting current alcohol use, one in five reporting current marijuana use, and one in seven reporting current binge drinking. Um, also, we have seen um, a current prescription opioid misuse. So 7% of US high school students reporting using prescription opioids, and then over 14% reporting misusing prescription opioids at least once in their lifetime. Next slide. So um, the drug use among, among U.S. high school students who reported current prescription opioid misuse. We also are seeing common misuse of other drugs. So very high rates of previous 30-day marijuana use, alcohol use within the last 30 days, or binge drinking within the last 30 days. And also concerning is the uh, once uh, use of cocaine, methamphetamines, and heroin among high school students who reported current prescription opioid misuse. So prevention at this stage is really, really important for our young people. Next slide. So uh, Dr. Baldwin gave a really great overview of the Drug-Free Communities Program. Um, and this is a snapshot to show you um, the 700 plus community-based coalitions across the country that are working to prevent youth substance use. Um, and when we talk about substances, it's fairly broad and includes a lot of the substances that I just referred to, alcohol, marijuana, prescription drugs, also tobacco and other illicit substances. And you see up in the right-hand corner some of the data that Dr. Baldwin um, had uh, gone over about the reductions that certain DF that DFC communities have experienced uh, among middle school and high school students. Next slide. So the theory in kind of in keeping with um, some of the um, previous remarks about um, the community-based work and local control, the theory of the DFC program is really about community, that a small amount of federal funding combined with a local match of resources and volunteer support can reduce youth drug use. And there's a real emphasis on the mobilization of community leaders to identify and respond to the unique needs and assets of those communities, and really focusing on the entire community to implement environmental change strategies. And when we talk about environmental change strategies in public health, we really talk about the environment, you know, where are kids, how are kids' schools, how are kids' communities, homes, um, where they play, how is that preventing youth drug use, and how is that supporting youth to make sure that they have limited access and availability to substances. Next slide. The two major goals, one obviously to reduce substance use among youth, but the other is community collaboration, to establish and strengthen collaboration among communities, agencies, federal, state, and local tribal governments, a lot of sectors across the community that when they come together can really be effective in addressing youth substance use. And there are a number of statutory eligibility requirements for a, a community coalition to be eligible to receive DFC funding. So they need a mission statement to address youth substance use. They need to be in existence for six months and address multiple drugs of abuse, not just alcohol, for example, or tobacco. Um, they need to be eligible to receive federal funding. So a lot of coalitions partner with um, a organization um, or other bona fide agent. They, um, they need to have a, a mutual kind of letter of collaboration if they're overlapping with another coalition. They uh, need a match from non-federal sources, which increases over time. Uh, they're limited to $125,000 a year and get one grant at a time, and no more than 10 years of DFC funding. 
And Grant mentioned the required sectors. Um, so if we go to the next slide, this is the these are the same sectors that Grant mentioned. I did want to kind of put a um, an emphasis on law enforcement, which is um, which is one of the required sectors. Um, and I think there's a real opportunity for collaboration with DFC coalitions and Haida communities. Next slide. And what is actually done by DFC coalitions? They develop and implement a 12-month action plan that's community-focused, again, not just focused on individuals, but the community at large, and focusing on com affecting community-level change, looking at beliefs, attitudes, perceptions, and practices. They are also required to participate in a national cross-site evaluation every two years on core measures related to alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, and prescription drugs. Next slide. And one of the major frameworks they use in order to come up with action plans is the seven strategies for community level change. Um, and what's important about this slide is that in public health, we really think about a comprehensive approach. So not just maybe a training or not just maybe a flyer to provide information, but also what are, what are we doing in our communities to um, reduce barriers for youth to, um, to have access to um, better ways in which to engage with one another without substances. How are we changing consequences? How are we highlighting those um, those great businesses that are um, that are being supportive of some of the youth substance use prevention policies? And are we modifying and changing policies that are going to support our communities to prevent youth substance use? And so we really right, like to promote this comprehensive approach. Um, where all of those different levels are addressed by a community coalition. And next slide. And in addition to our close partnership with ONDCP, we are also um, uh, enjoy our close partnership with the Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America, or CADCA. And um, between uh, ourselves, CADCA, with um, ONDCP as the administrator, we're looking forward to continuing the great work of the DFC program um, and look forward to you know, working in collaboration with all of you as well. Next slide. So just um, want to thank you for, um, for your attendance today and I will pass it back um, to the, um, to back to ONDCP, thank you. Great, thanks, Karen. This is Grant. Um, at the end, at the end of that, I indicated that we'd have a chance to um, plenty of time for Q and A, and I appreciate um, everyone that's already submitted um, questions into the managed Q and A. Please continue to do that. Um, I thought right now, in our remaining time, we just go through the questions one by one. Um, Rita, Karen, and I can field them as appropriate, and we'll just go through them in the order they, they were received. But again, please, as, as you sort of reflect on the conversation we've just had, please um, feel free to add your questions into the mix. So the first question came in from Shelby and, and asked about how they can, can anyone apply for an OD map login? Yeah, I think um, my suggestion is to connect with the Washington Baltimore Hider, specifically Jeff uh, Besson or Elise Alter, who runs the program. They have set up a structure where you can have sort of phased um, login in terms of what level of data access you can have available to, to you. Uh, Jeff or Elise would be the best person to um, attend to that. But I will also say one of the real uh, benefits of OD Map is, as Rita indicated, just to reinforce her point about now casting, if you will. You know, again, at CDC, we have sort of gold standard surveillance requirements. OD Map gives you a sense, a preliminary sense of what's happening. And there's some real opportunities to link, um, to link data sources as well. So in an era with the uh, landscape changing so rapidly, we really need to have that uh, very, very timely data. So, um, so thanks for the question, Shelby. Rita, anything you want to add to that OD map question? Nope, uh, and I think that was exactly what folks can do. And certainly Jeff Beeson, Elise, they will be very quick to respond and they can help you. Great. So the next question uh, was from James and uh, I think it was more of a comment. He was saying, well, the, they, 
He agrees and feel that the overdoses have increased during the pandemic. Uh, he wonders what the real increase is and believes that reporting may actually be prioritized and proved year over year. I think that's probably true, but I think there's enough uh, information out there to indicate that it's a true increase. And, and I think we've all experienced sort of the realities of living through a pandemic, unfortunately, um, exacerbate things that ultimately potentially drive somebody to use in the first place. And it, by the way, I would say if the numbers hold, if any, even just a 10% increase in deaths and the provisional estimates that I showed from from uh, 2019 hold, we're looking at potentially over 80,000 Americans losing their lives um, to an overdose um, in 2020. So there are some real sequela associated with the pandemic, and this is just one of them. And frankly, just um, reinforces uh, why and how much uh, further we have to go and, and how nimble we have to uh, uh, be to address the problem. Uh, Rita, anything else on that one? No. I you know, I might just note that we're very interested in understanding more about what is happening, and we hope to be able to get some information from people who are suffering from addiction and people who can tell us more about is what are these conditions doing or not doing to, um, to you as a person and your community. So we're making some guesses that there's more stress, that there might be a disruption in treatment services, et cetera, et cetera. We want to to learn more and we're in active conversation about that right now. Yeah, thanks, Rita. Okay, so next up is Lee asked a question. Based on other research on the topic, it appears that uh, these overdoses and increased substance uh, abuse and use are largely in the millennial generation, those born in the 80s and 90s range, especially for opioids. What are um, speculated causes for generational discrepancies and how might we as a society combat use in the most vulnerable demographics? And I think the reality for us, and I think we've seen this with the increase in cocaine and meth deaths, um, you know, at times early on in, in the drug overdose epidemic, the opioid overdose epidemic, we really focused on sort of white rural America. And I typically say now this is an everyone everywhere problem. There's virtually no demographic of society that has not been impacted. Um, and I think um, the poly substance crisis is an indication of that uh, because there was differential demographic trend use. So um, I perhaps there are different generational differences, but I think uh, for us at CDC, we're really focused writ large on um, you know ver use is going up in virtually every age spectrum. Okay, um, Molly next asked a question, does this funding complement and or are these conversations occurring with SAMHSA so there's not duplication of services? Of course, yeah, so uh, we work very closely. We uh, see ourselves obviously as our uh, CDC's name indicates on the prevention side. Uh, we don't, obviously we're not uh, providing direct services uh, per se, but we feel like public health can be a, um, a linkage safety net um, and a, you know, it's sort of a, we're operating under a, it takes a village mindset and there's some real opportunities. So we work closely with SAMHSA, interact with them regularly, talk about how we make sure that our work complements what they're trying to do. In fact, some of the requirements of OD2A, uh, uh, which is that large scale cooperative agreement program, you sort of, you're required to showcase the connection points that you have between the state health department, state behavioral health, and other agencies involved in drug overdose response. I'd say, and, and, and I'll ask Rita potentially to talk more about this with FAST and RxStat, one of the things born out of that is that there really is so many component parts, not just behavioral health that have a role in response or public, public uh, safety that has a role. There's a lot of other touch points, housing, uh, employment, et cetera. So the short answer is yes, we do have touch points. Rita, do you want to add anything else there about sort of multi-sector collaboration? Yeah, no, I think you really hit the nail on the head that, you know, we have spoken at great length about the importance of public safety, obviously behavioral health, treatment providers. But I think the more we are working in this space and getting closer to the ground in real communities, we're seeing, you know, homeless services, um, you know, folks who are in the business of long-term recovery and all the supports that might be necessary. It's one thing to link a person to treatment and care, very important, but to stay in recovery. So you need supportive housing in some cases, transportation, um, sometimes it's employment services. We've had all kinds of players at the table at state and local levels. Um, they're about how complex the problem is, and just how comprehensive it is. 
But I think you said it very well, Grant. It, it's uh, um, it's of partners. Great. Next up, Anna asked, I think, a, an easier question for us to answer. Uh, could you say the name of the uh, program again? So uh, our large state-based program, the one that funds the um, 47 states and 16 big cities and counties, is called Overdose Data to Action. And we named it um, intentionally to sh show what we're trying to do. Basically, how can you use timely data to drive action um, in the community's hardest hit. And, and we're really pressing for faster, both fatal and non-fatal data collection. On the fatal side, we're getting much more circumstantial information. Again, much like FAST and RX data are intent in, intending to do, the hope here is basically, if you know, and we just came out with a vital signs a few weeks ago with colleagues um, in the division uh, put out, which I, just remarkably well done, that showed um, a fairly significant number of people had a natural touch point at some point immediately preceding their death that could have been a, a linkage opportunity to either, um, you know, provide them with naloxone um, and or link them into long term recovery. Okay, next uh, is a question from uh, Kate. She asked, do health insurance policies support non-medical pain therapy through broad coverage, massage, acupuncture, et cetera? I mean, I think that's a great question, Kate. I think uh, we part of what we're doing is as the evidence base builds on what are the non-pharmacologic therapies and their utility for um, long-term pain management, I think insurers are broadening what their coverage. Of course, it's insurer specific, but um, as, you know, uh, health, larger health systems and insurers are being more and more responsible opioid stewards as we better understand the the risks and benefits of long-term opioid use to, to make sure, are there cases where people should be on long-term opioid therapy? Yeah, there probably are people who have done well for a good while, but you know, in many instances, the risks outweigh the benefits. And so we want to make sure those other options are available and that you know, I think one of the big take homes for us is that pain needs to be adequately treated. We are absolutely interested in, in pain being adequately treated. We just don't want to, we don't want that treatment modality to ultimately put somebody at risk. Okay, and the next question is from Michelle Park. She asks, are the RX uh, campaign real stories on the CDC website? Yes, I'd encourage you to go to cdc.gov forward slash drug overdose. You can navigate from there or just Google the RX awareness campaign. Um, even the most, most hardened among us are likely to be impacted by these stories. Uh, the longer versions of the stories really hit you in the heart and in the gut uh, in terms of um, the realities of, and the tragedy and the struggle that, that, that people had to, to go through in their, um, um, if they've lost a loved one and they're telling that story or the, the recovery, their recovery journey, just incredibly powerful. And I think we think it's a natural complement to the great work we're trying to do with um, data and data sharing. Um, yeah, so the next question from Valerie, I think we've partially answered, is SAMHSA connected to this work as they've built out a prevention infrastructure for decades? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the short answer is yes, we are actively working uh, both directly with SAMHSA as well as through our um, state and local counterparts to, to coordinate with behavioral health. Um, the reality for us is that with the, with the, um, with the trends we're seeing in drug overdose, um, you know, we're not nearly where we need to be. We've we've seen a, a plateauing, as I mentioned, in prescription and heroin related deaths. But, um, you know, fentanyl is 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 really a scourge for us. And, and so there's plenty of opportunities for us to to collaborate across the federal, state and local landscape. And we're pursuing all of those avenues uh, vigorously. So the next question is from Kristen McConnell. Again, please keep the questions coming in. How can community coalitions utilize the CDC guidelines for prescribing opioids to reach and engage prescribers? Maybe I'll ask Rita to take this after saying, uh, I will say part of what we're doing through OD2A is um, supporting um, uh, academic detailing to prescribers in local communities where prescribing patterns are uh, appear to be outside of uh, standard medical practice. So. Uh, co community coalitions, I think, can work with their state and local counterparts to support that academic detailing um, uh, to reach their local prescribers. It's unfortunately a, a sort of a classic Pareto principle where you have a very small number of prescribers prescribing a, a, a large volume of, of pills and something we need to attend to. Um, Rita, do you want to say anything more about academic detailing? Yeah, just that that comes up a lot. And some folks don't know what detailing is. It's essentially following the model that pharmaceutical companies have used to have one-on-one -on -one interactions with clinicians. 
providers, an effort to educate them and, and change their behavior. Um, so that's what we're doing, and we have been doing it in a number of communities and training people who live there. So there's a local expertise and a local capacity to, to do this work. As Grant said, not everybody probably needs that much intensive effort, but in the places where it is um, warranted, it has proven to be a very effective strategy. So I would, I would say that is, that's a great way to use the guideline. We have been working with detailers to essentially educate them, help them understand how they can prescribe more safely. Um, we are putting out an implementation guide on how to do academic detailing. We're not done yet, but I think that could mm -hmm. be handy as well. Um, and we've also been working with um, the folks who make electronic health records to try to figure out what kind of architecture what kinds of things can we put right into those medical records that could you know, pop up either with an alert or a little nudge to sort of um, help them prescribe more safely? And that might be something that wouldn't be all that difficult to perhaps um, put into particular healthcare systems. So lots, there's actually a lot of movement on the prescribing front, but I would say detailing yeah. is a great way to go. Thanks, Rita. That's great. And I, I would just, uh, in a reinforcing way, uh, encourage folks to reach out to Rita and her colleagues, either through me or, or reach out to her directly. She is a, a wizard at um, implementation and translation work and is thinking, really, you know, scaling up these evidence-based programs and initiative takes a special um, um, initiative and, and um energy and enthusiasm and conviction and 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 Rita certainly has that and and uh, it's it, you know just super excited about the work that um, her branch is doing so the next question I actually think Rita if you could take uh, wholesale it's I'll just read it to you it's can the toolkit for MAT that the National Council for Behavioral Health be used in juvenile justice system programs that's a, sh a Shante yeah Hi, thanks, Ashante. I would say look at the toolkit. It is meant for the broadest uh, application possible, but we have so many partners who worked on that and we're continuing to learn more uh, from criminal justice partners that I would say give it a look. It's available online and I can, if you want to write to me, my email is just like my name, R Noonan, R N O O N A N at cdc.gov, and I can direct you to that if you can't find it. But I would say it is meant for broad application. But if you need further support, we have lots of partners we can connect you to. Great, thanks, Rita. Karen, the next couple are, and maybe more than a couple, but I'll mention the first. Uh, the first couple are for you, really. When can you, uh, we expect to? And when are we expecting to announce the new DFC grantees? And where can law enforcement agencies find information on which cities or counties are considered DFC communities? So great questions. Um, before the end of this calendar year, we'll be releasing um, the announcements for the new awards in addition to the competing continuations. So these are our new year one coalitions and then coalitions that have completed five years and have been um, successfully awarded another five years of funding. So um, before the end of this calendar year, we anticipate um, releasing and announcing those awardees. In terms of uh, the location of DFC coalitions, as we kind of release um, in collaboration with ONDCP, as they kind of announce and release those awards, there is a kind of a table that is located on ONDCP's website. Um, and we are going to link um, to that uh, table and to those listing of recipients, which shows kind of state, city, um, and where those uh, coalitions are located. Um, I think as a as the new um, you know man manager of the DFC program, the um, the master list is one of my high priorities to make sure that we have a good understanding of where all of our co you know 700 plus coalitions are, who they are. Um, and and really make sure that we're helping not only to support them, but also to connect them with the resources that we know are out there. You know, public health is a great convener of all different sectors and um, where we uh, where we can connect them to state and local um, resources to help them with their work. We have a very strong interest in doing that. Great, thanks, uh, Karen. So the next question, two questions from Danielle and David are really focused on um, adverse childhood experiences or ACEs and the intersection with the DFC program. I'll just 
uh, paraphrase what they're asking and then the group of us can answer. So a lot of attention has been put on solutions, focused interventions and exposure to adversity being risk factors for early initiation of substance use and for poor outcomes. Traditionally, the logic models that CADCA has coached DFC recipients to create are problem-focused root causes that make it a challenge to address ACEs and other root causes. Uh, do we see this creating new op our new partnership creating opportunities to uh, very much directly address ACEs? Um, and then David's question is, uh, children being raised by parents who engage in parenting behaviors and practices is generally recognized as supporting their healthy development, rarely adopt self-destructive behaviors. Conversely, parents being raised by parents who engage in parenting behaviors and practices generally recognize disrupting their health, healthy development, often adopt self-destructive behaviors. So um, what I would say to you is that I think there is a willingness and an, and an energy around attending to um, adverse childhood experiences. In fact, at the CADCA mid-year conference, um, some of our subject matter experts, uh, including uh, Chris Jones, uh, presented a, a long session on ACEs. Um, you know, as you know, we're a science driven agency as the science evolves, we're eager to support and, and Rita mentioned the Martinsburg initiative. I think we are thinking more and more and, and you saw in my slides around preventing youth initiation and use obviously attending to ACEs is a critical component of that. So I don't know, Karen or Rita, if you want to talk a little bit more about the ACE work, Rita, maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the great school based work that you're um, leading as well. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll start. I, I think um, I definitely um, agree with kind of the, you know, looking at those underlying drivers of youth substance use and ACEs is, is, is one in particular um, that I, I think is something we are interested in. And, you know, in addition to the work that the, you know, our division does within the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control, there's also the Division of Violence Prevention that also has some has work focused on on ACEs and a number of different toolkits and resources to address some of those issues. So where it makes sense for a community to focus on those issues, I think we'd be very supportive of that um, in collaboration with with CADCA and ONDCP, who I think are also um, uh, also see the kind of drivers for for youth substance use prevention and ACEs uh, uh, see a real link there. And then in terms of parental behavior, I, I think that you know the the fact that um, in addition to looking at youth behavior, there's also uh, parental uh, perceptions and practices that are also captured as as part of um, the co data that's collected for for DFC coalitions. So we certainly understand about that those parental practices as being um, impacting kids and their behaviors. Um, I'd also state that it is the environment within which that family unit um, exists um, that is also extremely important and also a really great opportunity for prevention, uh, comprehensive prevention strategies. Thanks, Karen. Rita, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, is, is my microphone still on? My screen did something funny. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Oh, good. Oh, good. Thank you. That's why I, I'm afraid to ever uh, put my uh, mic off. So, you know, I, thank you, Karen. I think that's that's all great. There's actually a huge body of science and research about adverse childhood experiences. Our colleagues in our center have done really wonderful work. Um, but just a couple things about parenting in particular, I want to just make a note of that. I think the good news is there's actually a lot of evidence for parenting programs being effective. You have the Triple P program that was, I believe, Matt Sanders, uh, widely, you know, used across the globe, uh, family support centers. There are things that we're peppering into, for example, the Martinsburg Initiative that's based on actually a lot of, you know, evidence about what's been working and what is feasible within communities and desirable. Um, so I think that's kind of the good news. Um, there's also just a lot that we're learning about how we can link up all these things. And, you know, Dr. Baldwin um, mentioned school-based programs. There's a good number of them that have shown some effectiveness. Sometimes we are, I think, a little too optimistic about the big effects you might get. And there is a, there's a number now that have made uh, substance use part of the outcome that they're measuring. And so... Schools can make much better use of those kinds of things. Of course, under COVID, now we're trying to think about how do you implement them under these conditions. But I think the good news is there's a lot of research, a lot of evidence. There's a lot of tools in the toolbox, and I think we Great. 
Thanks, Rita. We only have a couple of minutes left. I'm going to try to do uh, some rapid fire uh, to get through. There's a, a number of other robust questions. Karen, any major changes anticipated with the DFC program now that we are lead, uh, providing administration of it? No, I don't think there will be any major changes. What I do think um, you'll see is, is much more of a, of a continued connection uh, between uh, our substance use um, and youth substance use prevention partners and coalitions and, of, and the partners um, that we fund out of CDC at the state and local level. And that increased kind of partnership and engagement is what we're really focused on um, and don't uh, anticipate any major changes to the program. Great. Michael asked a question about sustainability after funding. I would say on DFC program, part of why the match requirement is in place, I think, is to build up that sustainability. You want to say anything else about sustainability, Karen? Um, all DFC coalitions are required to develop a sustainability plan also. And um, I know that's something that um, we as um, you know, as a federal public health agency, um, in addition to in partnership with others, are warrant, really want to support coalitions in their sustainability planning um, and next steps. There's another question about when will DFC project officers be available for virtual site visits? I know you've just we've just stood up a very substantial branch and, and you've built out a, a, a great team. Um, what say you about uh, virtual site visits? So I think we're um, we're looking towards the latter part of 2021 to really start um, full on virtual site visit engagement. We really want to make sure that we set up the best possible um, framework for those site visits. Um, we have some lessons learned. I know um, ICF, the contracts with ONDCP that help support the national cross site evaluation is starting to do some virtual site visits. So we really want to get some lessons learned from them as we um, do some robust site visits um, towards the latter part of 2021. Great. Well, on behalf of uh, Rita, Karen, and I, I want to say thank you again. Thank you particularly for all the rich questions. I apologize that we weren't able to get through all of them. Um, uh, hopefully that's a reflection of your interest in, in what we were talking about. Happy to, uh, it's just been a real privilege for the three of us to be here. So with that, let me turn it back to our ONDCP colleagues. I don't know if they need to say anything before we transition to the next session. I guess I, we are closing out and um, adjourning for lunch. Um, do you all need to say anything, um, ONDCP, or should we um, have people enjoy their lunches? Yeah. And we <laughs> yes, we do, Grant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Grant, Rita, Karen. Wow, um, I, I'm still kind of digesting a lot of what you just mentioned uh, on several of your different programs, but also a lot of the resources that you have that maybe not others are aware of. Um, and I appreciate the deeper dive into some of those. Thank you very much for that. Um, your insight into your ways of thinking, um, not only you, but the Surgeon General and ONDCP with Director Carroll um, and Nora Volkov with uh, NIDA. I feel like we have, to use Grant's words, really experienced a very rich morning today of content. And you have done so beautifully in laying that stage and setting the stage for our afternoon workshop and resource panel to be held later today. I did want to follow up with one thing. ODMAP has a website, and that is odmap.org. So any of you who did have some more detailed questions about ODMAP, please reference that website. It's a wealth of information and can guide you in the right direction. I also wanted to highlight one more time that at the bottom of your screen, the left-hand side, you should be able to see your event resources tab. It does um, show an arrow next to it. And if you click that arrow, it will unveil several different resources that are available to you. We have been adding additional resources throughout the day based on some of your requests. So please uh, continue to access that. And I believe that all of those resources that have been added even from previous sessions will be available in future sessions as well. Is that correct, Amber? Yes. Okay, so now we are going to break for a one hour lunch. We will see you back at 1.15. And I just want to put a plug in here. We're going to be showing our questions from this morning to allow you to reflect 
as you're having something delicious over lunch today. Reflect on your movement towards extraordinary, and we're excited to bring the National Prevention Science Coalition in this afternoon. It's a very dynamic presentation, and they will be leading what we're calling a cognitive workshop, a mental and cognitive workshop on moving towards extraordinary. So we'll see you back then.